Approximate inference. So far we have calculated probabilities exactly. But that often is too expensive, so in this section I'll talk about sampling methods to approximate um, probabilities. So the basic idea is that um, rather than calculating the probabilities, we sample from the distribution and simply count how many cases of one or the other type appear. So let's assume we have a probability for A being 0 of 0.3 and a probability for A being 1 of 0.6 let's say and probability of being 2 is 1 etc. So of many other cases but only the first two have a significant probability. So if these are many different cases you can imagine that it's hard to calculate the probabilities but if you sample from that you get a pretty good approximation because uh, the first two are significant and the rest just share the last 10% probability. So if you have a process that's relatively cheap and you can sample from that and you sample 10 times maybe you get uh, first a 0 then a 1 then another 1 another 1 a 0 a 1 a 1 some other value and then a 0 again and a 1 so that's 10 right good so, and then you would estimate that the probability here would be 0.3, quite correctly. Yeah, actually, I mean, by, by accident, actually, I hit the nail here. And then you have a probability of 0.1 here, even though it's not concentrated on, on one. So you roughly approximate the true probabilities by simply sampling and then counting the different cases. Now, in Bayesian networks, we have several variables to sample over, like here, a network um, with five different units, and let me, so let's draw a little network here, A, B, C, D, E. And then, uh, okay. and then we have some so if this is a a leads to b a b c d e okay, so try the whole thing here. this would be a. B, C, D, E, you just said A points to B, right? D and B point to E. This way, point to E, and B and E point to C. So we have such a structure. Now, if we really want to produce statistically independent samples of the state of the whole network, we would first sample from A, then from B given A, then from E given B, then from C given B and E, and then from D given E. Or the other way around, the other last two things. However, the idea of Gibbs sampling is, because that's quite expensive, you have to sample five times to get one overall sample. The idea of Gibbs sampling is to just sample one node. So we start with some initial condition, then maybe the one that we've just created, but then we visit E and sample E given the other nodes. And that produces, counts as an overall new sample. And then we sample C, etc. So we randomly go through the nodes and update 
uh, each node individually and each time we have updated one node that counts as a new example for the whole network. Now since we have a Bayesian network we can take advantage of the factorization in joint probabilities in uh, uh, conditional probabilities and that's shown here so if you want to sample D right we have to calculate P of D given A B C E that's formally this thing where this thing is uh, this term is the sum over this over D um, if you now replace the joint probability distribution by the product of conditionals we arrive at this expression and here we see that P of A cancels, P of B given A cancels and P of C given B E cancel. Yeah. So a lot of terms cancel so that we are left uh, with this expression here. So it's relatively cheap to sample a single node in such a network if it's not too fully connected. Let me illustrate with this this with a uh, simple example. Um, so I've made a little story here, but I cut that short and just tell you the probabilities. Um, we have two variables a and b, and the process goes like: first, we pick a with a probability of one half. Right, either 0 or 1 and then given A we pick B with the probabilities given here. Now if you have these two probabilities we can of course calculate the joint probability and from that we can derive the probability of B and also the probability of A given B. And what we need now for this process is P of B given A and P of A given B. Yeah, because we always want to sample from one variable given the other variable and we randomly alternate between the two variables. So this is shown here uh, in this table and I've used sort of a, a coin and some die, dice to do this but um, the point is that we start with some values for A and B, then we pick at random one of the variables, in this case A, and then we choose that randomly, either 0 or 1, depending on the value of the other node. Right? In this case, a 1 is picked for the 0, and then we pick the B variable, and then it, that switches to 1, so we have 1, 1, and then we randomly visit A a couple of times, and there's no change because if B is 1 then A can only assume the value of 1. So uh, we have a whole row of 1 1's here then we visit B but nothing changes by chance, right? Um, okay, so that way we create these pairs of values. We always at random visit one of the nodes and then we update that according to P of A given B if it's this variable, or P of B given A if it's this variable. That way we create these 100, va 100 uh, value pairs. Now if we have that, we can simply count how often does the value 1, 1 appear, how often does the value 0, 0 appear, and how often does the value 1, 0 appear, and how often does the value 0, 1 appear, and we see that the value 0, 1 is just completely absent here. No, nowhere do we have the value 0, 1 because that's an impossible combination by the way we have de designed the system. Now if we count these numbers and we go back to the table, we find these estimated probabilities, while these are the true probabilities, just sort of the numerical value uh, of these fractions. And we see it roughly matches, right? Not not very well, but sort of goes in the right direction. So this illustrates that it works to some extent, but it also illustrates uh, that you need a lot of samples in order to really have a faithful um, approximation of the true values. But often, even if it is such a crude 
approximation, it already halves learning, right? I mean, in the end, you want to make decisions or you want to drive some learning process. So often you don't need to know it exactly. Uh, such an approximation might be sufficient. But still, it's somewhat surprising that the approximation is so poor, given that we have sampled 100 value pairs. So now there's a reason for that. And we see that if we go, if you look at the transitions in state space, so here in this figure, I've illustrated the four different combinations that are possible. The first value is the value of A, the second value is the value of B. Now, the horizontal arrows indicate changes in the variable B, going from 1 to 0 here, for instance, and the vertical arrows indicate changes in the variable A. And the numbers here indicate the probabilities by which such a state, for instance, goes over to this state, goes over to this state, or remains in uh, the same state. Now, if you look at this, first of all, you can verify that the state 0, 1 is impossible. Um, but you also see that the transition from the state 0, 0 to 1, 0 or 1, 1 to 1, 0 is not very likely. So we have just a chance of 1 over 6 here and 1 over 8 here. So that means that the state of this network can move only between within these three nodes, because that is um, impossible. I shouldn't call these nodes within these three states, because that state is impossible. And if it's in this state, it actually sticks there for quite some time because before it moves here. And if it's in this state, it sticks in that state for quite some time before it moves here. And if it's here, it might actually move back so that not much has changed, right? So one says the mixing rate is low, right? So there's relatively little mixing between the states. And that hints at a condition that needs to be fulfilled in order for Gibbs sampling to work. Namely, there must be at some probability to transition from any probable state to any other probable state, right? Imagine this state is impossible. Then if you initialize the network uh, or the two variables um, in this state, then it's impossible to go over to the other state and then Gibbs sampling, of course, would give you uh, completely wrong results. So in order for Gibbs sampling to work, there must be a finite, so non-zero probability to go from any probable state to any other probable state, or possible state. Yeah. So I don't care so much about impossible states because they don't need to be sampled in any case, right? But between the possible states, there must be finite transition probabilities, plus you have to sample for a long time. And if you sample longer and longer, your approximation gets closer and closer to the true values. Now, the situation that it is very hard or computational just prohibitive to calculate the true probabilities um, that happens more often than you might think. So these approximate methods by Gibbs sampling um, are quite common.